All right, sorry to interrupt you guys. Uh, I love the discussion and everything, but we do have uh, almost 50 people, you know, waiting for us to go live. So as far as I know, we're live right now. And I just want to say, Vernon and David, thank you so much for joining us today. This is already, the energy has been awesome before we even get started. So I'm super excited about this uh, conversation we're going to have with Andre. So I, I just want to kick things off and remind everyone who's viewing that um, Andre is hosting this new show every two weeks. It is about creativity. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to try sticking with this time slot every other Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. And uh, Andre is a really just a super improviser. He's got great connections uh, in the music industry, and he's going to have a lot of great guests. Uh, in two weeks, we have uh, our guests set up, and it's going to be Julie Slick and Beth Fleener, uh, musicians out of the Seattle area. Really excellent. And we're also uh, trying to get Andy West and Henry Kaiser uh, for a follow-up episode sometime in February. So that'll be really cool. Uh, if you are interested in checking out these shows, please hit the subscribe button and stay in touch on social media at Make Weird Music. Follow Andre at Guitar Tour. And then um, we are, I think, ready to start. So Andre, you ready to kick it off? Let's kick it off. Go for Let's it. Um, wow. Well, here we are. And uh, good to see you gentlemen again. And you too. You too. You too. <laughs> well, hey, let's start with when. What, what's the most recent time you, old and dear friends, have seen each other? In, in when you've seen the last other? time. The last time was the last Nam. I think we ran into each other, on the on the convention floor, and uh, and it was like it was like a rare sighting, of an exotic bird. I was like, it's David Dibble, Torn. Yeah. <laughs> it's David Torn. I know. So, when do when do I go to Nam anymore? Is one thing for I sure. Know. So great to see you. And this that was, was a year ago. Was a fun show. This was last year. I yeah, think it I think was, was two years ago. Was it two Maybe. years ago? No, it was. A, I thought it was the last one. Maybe. No, you know I didn't what? go last year. Okay, then it was two years ago. Good God Almighty! What is what's happened? Oh, that's right. Yeah, it was two years ago because uh, that right the pandemic wasn't on. Right, of course, it was two years ago. It wasn't. Yeah. And the, you were hanging with the drummer from New Orleans. Which? My old um, man. Um, Stanton? Uh, no, um, from the Meters. Oh, Zig Zigable Modelist. Yes. Oh, yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. That was, yeah. That, 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 that's why I got hypnotized when I said, I, I said hello, and you were involved in this, uh, like a, you had like a four-way going on with oh, like. Oh, yeah, but, but it was like. I, yeah. David, don't leave. <laughs> right. It was one of those. Nam was, doing... weird. Nam was weird because it's fabulous because you see people who are dear to your heart, but you don't, you literally, it's, it's for us, it's a, such a social event because we get to see people and yes. catch up with folks that we just, you know, because we're all running around doing whatever we're doing. And it's so great to see friends and people you're connected to. Um, yeah. That was a tough one for me, Vern, because uh, I did, I was playing at the Fryette booth and for the first, it's not the first time I've done it, but mm -hmm. instead of having an enclosed booth, it was out in the open and it was really fucking hard to pull off. I mean, right, right. you know, like I, I, I'm that guy who, okay, so too many people are playing. Well, I'm not going to start until these guys stop because sure. otherwise, sure. why would I do this? Why so, would you do it? Right. Yeah. So I, like I, on one level, I felt like a real jerk, but you know, if I'm, if you're trying to come up with something on the spot that might also have ambience and is no doubt going to be too loud for the room. <laughs> and other people are going to complain. It was just, it was really kind of, those guys are really my good friends, but I got super stressed out, you know? Like, I, know. I just how's, felt how's like, Steve, oh, How's Steve man. doing? I haven't seen Steve in a really long time. Oh, he's doing, I think he's doing really well, except for the pandemic hitting the, hitting his, hitting his business directly oh. in the center of the stomach, you know? Right. I, I was a VHT guy well, back in the day and Steve couldn't have been more 
Steve Fry is this really lovely guy. He's very he's very, lovely and he's very a, nice. Kind of a very genius nice dude. And a bad cat. The thing is, man, those those VHT amps are so heavy. Those amps are unbelievably heavy. Like the only thing I can compare it to is like an SVT head. See the SVT head. If you've ever been in a band and had to lift an SVT head, <laughs> yeah. it's the heaviest thing you've ever put your hand on. And then the and then it's like the next time you see SVT head, you say to yourself, that couldn't have been as heavy as I remember. I remember that. and then you try to pick it up and it's the heaviest thing right. you've it's, ever it's, tried to lift. It's not even like a twin. You go to pick up a twin and if it's a certain year. It's cool, but if it's got those big, gigantic JBLs, Tra I transform think. Transformer, oh my God, it's the heavy. It's like 100 pounds. Brutal. With, uh, brutal. Andre and brutal. I had my uh, my my Fryat uh, Deliverance 120 on the road, <laughs> right, Dre? Yeah. Which is, which is not, not, a, not a lightweight no. uh, amp to carry around. You know, oh we're God. just touring around uh, solo gigs, you know, with a... Oh. With a a, a D120. Beautiful yeah. engineering. Fantastic engineering. They sound amazing. Yeah. Very I, I was happy. at one point my my sound was like a was a an ADA MP1 mm -hmm. and uh and uh, uh yeah and a VHT and it was just uh redonkulous. Yeah, you know Re. I mean? Yeah. There yeah. was a blue there was a blue one. I had a I have a blue one and a red one and then there's a there's a purple. I know there's a purple VHT power amp as well so yeah fantastic well, I, well i'm sorry hey, go ahead dre no i was just gonna say th this is great i was just gonna interject that nam of course is gone uh for this year but I, it, it's virtual they're doing a whole thing with all these events and everyone's zooming in from zooming from, it, 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 it's music week or something they're calling yeah, it exactly so so this is interesting um Wow, you know, I'm gonna jump in. Just uh, we need to do like six of these to really capture what you gentlemen, you know, the, the catching up and the amazing things you've done together. One of the things I, I, I love about doing projects with Make Weird Music is how literal the crowd is. I mean, people know their music, so I don't have to waste time with introductions and a list of albums and what everyone's done. That's the beautiful thing. But I wanted to start with where we were chatting right before we got on. Because one of the things you gentlemen did that I think slipped under the slipped through the cracks. A lot of people have not heard or seen it was Guitar Oblique, which we were just mentioning. I'm going to put the link in in the YouTube chat. There's one concert, and of course Elliot Sharp. We're Absolutely. in touch with him. Yeah, he's the third of Guitar Oblique. He's going to do something on Make Weird Music right. in a couple months. Oh, so, super. Yeah, but talk talk to us a little bit about that. You were mem you were have some memories of Guitar Oblique and the Poland. Yeah. Oh and man, we uh, that was the knit. We uh, played the knitting factory, right? That was the thing. That that was the basis of the that record was a performance at the knitting factory, which and was that, the first. Was it the first gig or like? It might have been the first. It might have been the first. It was actually like the first gig. It was on. I it was think like it was the knitting factory when it was on Leonard Street. And, yeah, uh, and Vernon, if I can interject and just demonstrate for the folks what happened at that gig. Something like, ah! Remember your guitars almost fell down? Like eight guitars. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. There was some kind of crazy thing that went down, a near tragic accident. But but it wasn't. And but it, you we got kept caught, playing. It got caught right in the nick of time, yeah. Because yeah. we, heard the, we heard the audience go, woo. There was a <laughs> woo. There was a... You know? I, I, I actually didn't hear the whoop because I was making a similar noise myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there was like bad phase there. So oh I just I just jerked around and went, oh shit. And you were and you started to dive. And I was like, oh my God, he's gonna get hurt. What's going and we, on? And we managed to save the whole thing. It was very Yeah, really, it did work. It, yeah. It was, it, chills and thrills. What do you what do you, that's what we that's what uh that's what we're here for. You know, Dills and thrills say, and occasional spills. I know. David is is uh, one of my absolute heroes. And one of the reasons why David is one of my, there are many reasons why David Torn is one of my absolute heroes in the world of guitar, because he described himself, and this is so great. 
he's the first one to describe himself as an electronic guitarist. And I was like, I was so with it. I was so with it. Like, because the evolution of what we've been doing with sound really had moved in, really had moved into that. He was the first cat to really go all the way in. And, and you know, we, we both stayed with it. I mean, I think both of us have also do guitar, guitar stuff, but, but that, that element that, that, that leaked in, that, that I saw leaking in in the 70s mm -hmm. on, on, on my side, I, I, just, I just knew it was gonna be something. And it wasn't until the 80s that I realized, you know, it's not my job to be like Mr. Virtuoso. It's my job to like make this music sound more different, you know, uh, to be, act like more like an arranger. And that's what all the electronic stuff has done for all of us. And it was a, I, I'd say, um, it, I, I felt like I was predicting that something would happen. And it really didn't, it didn't like kick in that it actually happened. And it wasn't just like you and me and a couple of other people we know. It started to, it really became obvious to me that guitar was going electronic when the pedal things started to come up and yeah. people got really addicted to pedals. And then eventually people started looking at real sound modification rather than thinking always about playing the showy solo all the time and, and not thinking about what you play through the chorus, all right? Mm -hmm. um, but thinking about what makes my band sound different? How can I sound like, you know, how can I fill in as if I were like a fucking string quartet or, or small chamber group. And, and, and it's, it's a weird thing, especially I think for people like you and me who both have, have kind of ridden a line in different ways of like being not only somehow associated with avant-garde or whatever, right. mm -hmm. whatever they call that, but also with pop music and also with, Absolutely. you know, also with film music, which is popular music Absolutely. as well, Absolutely. that all these things can, can kind of coexist and you don't got to be branded as, as a avant-garde electronics only dude or girl or whatever, but you can make the, stretch the instrument out. And I, I think this is like a, it's a big thing for me lately. I have a lot of contact with players, younger players in mm -hmm. places that are that are consumer oriented, like the gear page, which is a hard place to hang, but it has had some good effects. I learned quite a bit there, but you see that there's a young group of musicians who are doing, they look first at these things, you know? Mm -hmm maybe sometimes at the cost of learning more about harmony or rhythm mm. or song structure or, but, but I think it's a cool thing that, 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 that the instrument has expanded and we were part of it, dude. I Absolutely. mean, we, we, we were there at the, at the, pretty much at the head and, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and, and didn't let it go. It's, I, I, I know it's still part of it for you. Oh, absolutely. You know? oh, absolutely. And unapologetic. And I think, and I, my thing about that is being unapologetic about that. You know, I don't, I don't like, there's no, there's nothing to apologize for, you know? Oh yeah. You know, like, 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 like I would say, like one of the first sounds that really, that really clued me in to electronics, so really clued me in to, to sound was uh, Bernard Herrmann's use of the theremin on the day the earth stood still. You know, yeah, that, that it just it just entered into my consciousness and altered my consciousness, you know. And, yeah. And there's nothing, you know, the thing about these because um, there's there's the authenticity wars. There's the there's all of this chit chat about what's real and what's not. And really being true to oneself, whatever that means, is is the ultimate. That's the ultimate thing. If it changes, yes. it does. If it doesn't, you know, it doesn't. I mean, and, and when I think about it just just thinking about the guitarists like Pete Cozy, like Adrian Ballou, like Steve Tibbetts, you know what I mean, like Fripp, 
You know what I mean? These I'm going to go backwards. I'm going to hit, I'll hit Lindsey Buckingham, man. Lindsey, Lindsey. One Lindsay, of the first real ambient Lindsay, players. Lindsey Buckingham. Tommy Chill. Bolin. Tommy Bolin. What he was Bolin, doing yeah. with, you know, with the Echoplex, you know, and, and it was so funny because I remember in, uh, um, an interview with him talking about the James game. And he, and he was talking about how, how thrilled he was to play with Billy Cobham because Billy Cobham totally embraced him doing this crazy, weird manipulation. Yeah. And, you know, he was talking about how he was getting resistant when he was in the James game, how you know, people were giving him shit for it. You know what I mean? And, yeah. And he felt fully embraced by Cobham because he said, man, do that. And so like that aspect because the thing about what Jimi Hendrix did, it, it was the way he would go from complete noise, really noise, and, and go from that to the quietest, gentle, his range was- Real like, dynamics, yeah. Nothing, his dynamics, did nothing, there was nothing like that. You know, there was nothing like it. And and the only thing, the only other thing for me was the later, like the period of Coltrane Crescent. You know what I mean? Yep. Like there was a point, you know, there was a point when when that point at which when uh Coltrane was having Farrell Saunders join him on stage. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, that point at which it had moved past the scalar strategies into pure sound. Music and sound, yep. And, and and that's the there's a funny crossover. Very the contexts were, were different, but there really is a, a crossover between a certain period of Hen live Hendrix and Dolphy and Train. Yeah, I was gonna say Dolphy. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and, and yeah, it, it it is amazing that uh, and I think. I think I'm going back to something you said about being unapologetic and and uh, and and I think I think I think the beauty of that is that it it points to the fact that what we end up doing is much more important than what we think or say about it, and also what other people think or say about it. The thing that's important is the the actual doing. I think that's why I got so deeply into these purely improvised scenes because because it's so you're so you so have to be there. You you just have to be there. You cannot you can't not be there. You have to dive in and you have to be in that water and otherwise you're it's it's nothing will happen and 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 it's. I mean, it's important that people get props for what they do and that people like it. But finally, it's really important that we keep on doing, <laughs> you know, right. that, that, right. that, that that's what it is. And you probably have had to apologize in some cases. I know, I know the feeling of like, famous saxophone player came to one of my first big solo gigs, a uh, well attended, I don't mean big, a uh, well attended solo gig in Chicago. And I had never played by myself there before. And he was at the show and he's a guy I know and we have friends in common. We were even in a band together once, excellent horn player. And um, he hung out after the show and he came backstage and he very offhandedly said to me, Hey man, uh, uh, nice sounds. And kind of like, it was like a, it was sort of like a backhanded compliment. Oh, that, oh, that old, oh like, yeah. Oh, the hidden you know, like, kiss. Oh yeah. I don't, believe don't get me started it, about that. It, it had, it had behind it, it, or it felt like it had behind it. And I'm not particularly paranoid. He, he, it had behind it. You know, I know you can't play shit, <laughs> but but the sounds were cool. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. how it felt. I really and uh, you know, and 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 you know that feeling that sometimes you musicians have to stand and stand behind what they do and keep doing it in order right. to in order to uh, be able to not apologize for for it. I'll apologize. Yeah. For 
for the shit well, there's, I a, make. there's an assumption that anybody could do. there's a there, there's this a, a presumption that anybody can do it and th that's simply not the case if you don't have the feeling for it you know that's the thing about people when they come off about certain things where they look at a style of music yeah yeah assume because yeah. The, the the style <clears throat> of music for them seems simplistic or seems easily graspable like what you hear it attitudes towards blues towards reggae music towards funk and it's kind of hilarious because it's like as if to say that anybody can be funky and that's it doesn't that is absolutely not the case. If you not the case. Feel, if you don't have the feel for it, it's not going to happen. It's the same thing about we mentioned Bob. You can you can practice, 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 and, and learn all the patterns and all like that. If it's not you, it's an imitation of life. Yeah. It just it just is. You're not gonna. There's you're not playing like Lou Donaldson. Don't pretend that you're gonna try to play like Lou Donald. So you're not. It's not gonna happen. It, you're not, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, yeah. and and you may sound good. You're not gonna be Sunny Stitt. It's not happening, right? So I think musicians waste a lot of time trying to be somebody else, trying to be another cat, when you need to be about the business of being yourself, and that can be frightening because you know you can, I, I, you can put up absolutely. a flag and no one salute. But you know where the twist is, or where I see the twist anyway, is that the twist that comes up is that we, when, we, when we're young and we do love it, we gotta copy. We have to copy. That's, it's, 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 the way, it's the best way of learning music is to feel something that somebody else did and say, I gotta do that, and then copy it and get it. Whether it's t a timbre, a tone, a phrasing, a rhythmic feel, any of those things. And so what, what we, I think what we lost like civilizationally is we lost that kind of, that teacher student thing that is old school, like that still exists in some places with that older music and, you know, in Hindustani music and in Ghazal and, and, and older musics like that, where there's a mentor and a mentee and, mm -hmm. And you do, I, I, I remember the first time I played with Don Vernon was mm. in a hotel room the night before. I had never met him before. It was the night before we played the Rainbow Theater in London. I had never mm. met him. I didn't know that much of his music. I knew Ornette's music, but mm -hmm. not Don's. Mm -hmm. So Don, Don said, uh, just meet me in my room at like, uh, uh, I'll be there around one in the morning. So meet me up there. So I had my charts for all the tunes and everything. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I came into his room and he was, he was pretty relaxed and sat down on the bed and he had his pocket trumpet and, and I took out my charts and he went, <laughs> No, no, you're not going to need those. And I went, well, I don't know all the melodies. And he said, okay, I'll just, we'll just play the melodies together. And then he played the melodies and I play them with him. And then, and we spent like an hour playing like four or five melodies. That's it. And he goes, great, this is going to be fun. That was it. That was the whole rehearsal, my only mm -hmm. rehearsal. The next day we were on stage at the Rainbow. And, you know, he would come over to me and say shit like, like, um, he just say stuff to me like, you know, you don't have to be a guitar. I know you. You could. You could. You. You could be. You, you could be. A, he'd whisper. You could be a Sorode, and then he'd walk away from me. Like, and it mm. wasn't. I don't think it was Don trying to be a guru or something like that. But he was imparting to me definitely what he felt. Mm -hmm. And you know, you take those things seriously, right? Mm -hmm. uh, man i wanted um, to and, and 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 um this is so great and i don't really have to do anything <laughs> this is I, I knew this would be so awesome but i wanted to jump in for the benefit of a few people who might not know of course you're speaking about none other than the great don cherry you know yeah. won't yes know yeah. that. we won't Thanks. know but i but i wanted to this is great because one of my questions and i want to let's say let's let's continue right here i wanted to say um 
both of you, and it's it's a, a, one of the many bonds you have besides being electronic guitarists, and and, and uh, just to, so much great stuff just went by there. Let me roll back and say Vernon. Beautiful reminder there that this is the man who, who who came out and said, "I'm an electronic guitarist," and 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 um, that is a, that's a profound moment. And Vern, you and I have talked about this copy of Electronic <laughs> Musician. We're 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 you oh know, my God, dude. you know, this, this is such an important moment. I think it for, was for me for many of the people watching and listening because this was like it's it's not guitar player. It's Electronic Musician magazine, and I remember going. I bought this in the in the stance, and it changed my life. And 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 Vernon, of course, electronic guitarist. That's that's on on the on the resume. I also think it's fascinating that both of you, early in your career, played and toured with giants. Each of you of avant jazz of third wave. I, I, I got to tell a story, but before I, I forget to tell it, because it. Sure, sure. it, it it, it's a it's a Vernon story. Okay. Uh -oh. Vernon, Vernon was do. I think you had begun Living Color. I think you had started, or you were doing something else. And Vernon couldn't do a bunch of gigs with Shannon, Ronald Shannon Jackson, the the right. drummer. Right. 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 And and I was so into that band. Oh. <laughs> so deeply, I was like, and and I don't know if it was you, Vern, that called me or. Or was it Melvin that called me? I can't remember who it was, but somebody somebody called and said, "Hey, uh, Vernon can't make these gigs. Could you could you come to rehearsal?" And I was, and I and all I could think of this has happened to me two times in my life. I thought I am not going to be able to fill Vernon's shoes, oh, and stop. all I could think I could not get this out of my head, and hmm. it didn't get out of my head, and I couldn't because partially because i i couldn't relax enough to just hang right right it was yeah. really intense i was trying to read his music and it his his handwriting was so beautiful oh, yeah, I, his, his, yeah, I was fucking hypnotized yeah. and <laughs> melvin's going don't don't worry about the charts man just play some shit right? play some shit that's right that's right <laughs> but Shanna, uh shanna was a um, remarkable i mean uh that was that was my that's the beginning of my professional life, you know, and, and Shannon was uh, so just a profound character, you know, yeah, profound, yes, profound composer. And the way he kind of uh, the collision of Western and Eastern values and in, in, in a way and for him, the West is the blues, you know what I mean? And, yeah. And to bring that together with a lot of his his Buddhist spirituality and then you know also through the just all that lifetime of music you know what i mean so everything from yes. and alley type melodies and jug band type melodies and he just uh i mean it was you know, he, i mean again from fort worth texas you, you know, were absolutely so amazing in that context at that period of time vernon that i think that it's one of those things that shouldn't disappear just because you got super successful with your own music. Right? <laughs> no, let's, let's keep going. <laughs> there, there were some of those gigs were like some of those. I, I remember hearing cassette tapes because there are many different eras of the decoding society. Right. And at one point, this was uh, Zane Masters on sax, Lee Rossi was on sax, Henry Scott the Third was on trumpet. And that lineup of the horns it was completely, and there was Reverend Bruce on bass. Right, Melvin, uh, Melvin Gibbs on bass and myself, and and that was that one particular iteration of the band was, I I, I unbel un really like incredible. Yeah. yeah I another, oh, sorry, sorry. No, no, no. This is another area again, just just for for some of our our listeners who are, are might have missed that one too. Ronald Shannon Jackson is 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 who Vernon is speaking about. I just put a link in. The uh, YouTube, fortunately, there's a lot of YouTube uh, 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 documents of, of that great band. Oh, rest rest, side, yeah. rest yeah. in peace, Ronald. And um, but a uh, uh, question about the, about uh, just talk. You already are talking about it, but tell us a little bit about how that since we're talking about creativity, working with cats like that. How did that impact your creative approach? How did that impact your 
your toolbox of ideas, your communication with other folks, because that that is some top level improv. Both of those worlds, mm. Don Cherry world and Ron Sean Jackson. Tell us a little bit about how you know before and after. How did that change your creative approach? If it did, well, I mean, <laughs> I always say there would there wouldn't have been a living color if it wasn't for the decoding society. You know, they just it just wouldn't have happened at all. And part of the reason was that, so Shannon did a very, very non, it wasn't pop music at all. And, but what I saw happen with him was that he grew an audience through, through touring. And it was very weird to, to show up in a college town and, you know, cause this music was very, it was kind of sideways. And we played a student union and it would be 15 people and then the next time we come, it would be 50 people. Then the next time we come, it would be 200 people. You know what I mean? And it just kind of, he really was a living example of sticking to your guns and not, again, not apologizing, doing whatever you, do whatever you're doing and don't look backwards about the thing that you're doing. He never, he was doing, and he was like, you know, he was doing his thing. And as much as he, he always gave honor to Ornette and to see so um he all you know he always did and uh and to albert Eiler. i mean he's the only drummer to play with cecil taylor ornette coleman and albert Eiler. and uh but he was but he was so tuned into the difference between you doing something and what you're trying to do that's like some real blues shit right there it's mm. like what you trying to, you know, like, I hear what you're trying to do, you know, and you ain't do, you know, you ain't doing the thing you're trying to do, right? Right. As opposed to you doing it. Yeah. And that difference is, is massive. Because that's the thing about playing with a cat, being a younger dude, because I was in my 20s, you know, and playing with a guy, he was, at that time, he was in his 40s, upper 40s, you know? And he saw us, the band, and he saw all this stuff going on. He saw, and he's like, you know, he's relating to it like, oh yeah, I remember when I was, I remember that, you know? And it's only till you get to a certain age and you look back and you see younger cats and you go, oh, I get it. You're in that, you're in that phase right there. Yeah. You know? That's a, that's a, it's a psychic shift in a way, or maybe it's more than psychic. Maybe Maybe it's like, as far as music goes, maybe it's sort of more like a, a crossover between will and, and whatever your spirit is, you know, mm. that, that, that they come together and you have to have the will because you're not going to, you know, you, you'd just be lucky if you, if you get to do what you want. Most people aren't just lucky. Most mm. musicians aren't. Um, you, you, it, there's no, that, that shit doesn't work, but that combination of actually realizing that you're not doing what you're trying to do, right. And, and, and stepping it up or stepping down or mm -hmm. kind of clamping down on where you think you should be. I, I think, I think we make a lot of really weird creative decisions as we move along. You know, I, I, I know, I know that there was a point where I, I I remember specifically, it it wasn't it, it wasn't a social thing. It was, it was I don't want to play solos. I don't want to play any guitar solos. I am not. I am no longer working on speed. I do not want to work on speed. And I purposefully stopped using a pick because I couldn't get myself out of of always playing like super quick stuff. Uh, even when I didn't want to, I would do it because, because I I was used to the muscle memory of practicing, right? And mm. I made a decision one day and went, okay, well this isn't working. If I play slow, that works. Uh, uh, man, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna. One day in the '90s, I just went. It was Polytown. It was around Polytown. I had been recording all this stuff, and I and I, at home, I was like never using a pick it didn't matter you know and my plane got sloppier even and and i went yeah but this is right this feels right this feels like me this this shit feels like me 
like what I'm doing is this. And I kept looking for other ways to expand that idea of blowing up my idea of who I was. Mm. And that has never really gone away. I, I always, if I think of myself as a certain thing, I always want to break it. Mm. <laughs> you know, I, I want to change that. I think, well, that's that this is good and this was good and I was really in this, but when I'm not good, I'm leaning on too many things that I know, too mm. many things that I know, find something else. And I what? started finding ways of playing. I actually learned something from Wayne Krantz that I don't think he knows I learned from him, nah. which, which Wayne has a way of, uh, he had a way back in the day of, of using open strings all the time in the middle of his phrasing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's super cool. Now, now if I did that with my harmonic sensibility, I could use that as like another surprise effect in my own playing. Mm. To me, something that surprises me that I'm gonna have to react to because I'm playing wrong notes. Uh, on purpose, <laughs> you know. <laughs> like, so, 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 and 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 so, I started developing ways of phrasing to do that um, beyond my my regular old thing, which was which was if I get frustrated playing something, or it, same mm -hmm. thing as if I had a cramp in my hand, I just start whacking the guitar. I just start hitting it. You know, I I I'd squeeze it instead of like stopping. I'd squeeze it as hard as I could. Right. <laughs> or, or or choke the strings or pull them up or do anything like that as a kind of emotional reaction to something I was frustrated doing, playing mm. too fast, not capable of playing as fast as I wanted to, but make that into a musical sound rather than treat it like, you know, I've gone, I've gone off the deep end. This is going to be a musical sound because it's an electric guitar and I can make it sound like this is part of the music. That's a pretty odd, probably a pretty odd thing to say. But, well, you know. what, I'm, what I'm hearing a lot, and it's beautiful for, for folks tuning in, um, and, and there's so many lessons here, but one thing I'm hearing a lot, and Vernon, you said it, uh, you said it, if, if you're trying to play bebop and it's just not you, it's an imitation of life. And then you said, about Shannon saying a very similar thing, like just do it. And then Vernon, and then and David, you've said a few times this idea of just be there, just be. And I think this is this is something that should be simple to people, but it's really not. Like just no. the honesty, just be honest. Just don't try to be some other shit. Uh, and I think I think that's coming across loud and clear from you, gentlemen. Um, I want I want to jump and see if we have a couple questions. And and David, I want you to to touch base on. On uh, on the before and after Don Cherry and how that affected your toolbox, but just looking at a couple questions here, um, some someone asked about. Let, let's just do a jump cut to um, to some other albums you guys have done. Uh, of course, the twentieth century. You're on pretty much all the David Bowie records. I, I think may, just not the final one. Is that correct? You're on everything not else. Black Star, yeah, not Black Star. So. so Tell us a little bit. Sorry. You know, according to David, um, he got in touch with me around the time he was recording Black Star before it became a band thing. And he told me at that time that there was something for us to do together again, but it wasn't going to be until January or February. And then mm. again, I got I I got a I got an email from him before when he he knew he was dying and he said all he said was I know we're going to do something together again soon and and but there was something I can't remember I actually have the email of course but uh there was something really touching that he said that I don't remember at the moment but um it, it was clear to me actually it was clear to me that he wasn't in good health as you know, Andre, I, I thought he was, I thought he was ill well before right. Black Star occurred. I, I was sure, I was sure that he was deeply ill while yeah. we were doing um, um, the, the, next day? the next day. Yeah. No. We, then we were on tour. You were talking about that. Uh, talk about that for a minute too, because one of the most remarkable things about the next day is someone 
with the stature and fame of David Bowie, you guys pulled that album off in secret in New York City. Yeah. Well, what because, the fuck? How did that? Well, it was it was a str- really a strange situation because they they required David and his organization required that no one tell anyone anything about when we were recording, nor where we were recording, nor that we were recording at all. Mm-hmm. And and they and and I'd never heard this from David before, so I presumed that he was under some kind of public threat. That was my presumption at the time, that that he mm. just really, uh, that something was happening that he was uncomfortable with and didn't want this to be public. Maybe he didn't want the record company to know that we were doing it. I doubt it was that small, but 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 it could have been. But um, yeah, we did it. He We signed contracts, we signed non-disclosure and we only talked to each other and we told no one and somebody Two somebody's got fired because, and the studio, the original studio, got fired, which wasn't in New York, um, as far as I know, it wasn't in New York. Um, but but uh, but it was all very strange, and and I mean, one of the musicians got fired for for acc- I think accidentally uh, talking about it to somebody, and the studio got. The first studio got completely blown out of the water. So when that came around, we really kept it quiet. It was a little weird to be downtown and, you know, go outside of a toy. It was that place called the Toy Factory. Toy, 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 yeah, right. Um, music music shop, Toy Factory. I can't remember. Um, yeah, yeah, I know the one downtown. Yeah. The famous place on uh, on uh, in, in, in Soho. Um, shit, I can't remember. Um, but it was weird. It was it was really a strange thing, Andre. That that, you know, I know people in New York, and I I know more people in New York now than I've ever known. And so you know, we're going outside to have a coffee. Hey, what are you doing? Oh, nothing. But uh, but uh, I'm I'm just working on my gear in a studio somewhere. Oh, can I come? No, I'm, I'm I. It's it's kind of like nah, probably not. Um, I, 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 it was very weird. Very odd thing. Yeah, we pulled it off in like a couple of weeks. Um, Secret. Secret. Now, now, in terms of, um, give, give us a quick snapshot of. Um, I mean, he he would just play you the track, or or, or, or the engineer would, or because oh, I mean, this this was a very different record for me be, with David because in 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 on Heathen and Reality and all the extra tracks that we did, it was usually just me and David. And, and an engineer, me and David and Mario McNulty, me and David and Tony, me and David and Brandon um, Mason. It, it, it All of Heathen was just me and David and a, an engineer, all of it. And yeah. same thing for for reality. It was, it, it was, it, uh, I was, so I had a lot of time to sit there and go, okay, I have an idea. Uh, can I get to work now? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. And, uh, and and a lot of times in in those first couple of records, in the first record, David was present until he saw me doing something. I'd have an idea like the opening to even all that that looping rhythmic looping stuff. Um, he you know as soon as he heard me doing that, he goes, "Okay, I'm going to go hang out with Lexi and have some lunch, and and uh, just let me know when you when you think you're done with this, <laughs> you know." <laughs> Uh, but 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 the next day was a completely completely different thing. It was the band live, not a great environment for me because I ended up in the control room and and I don't enjoy that as a guitarist. I like standing in front of my amp, no matter what the volume is. I like being in front of it so I can control the amp, you know. Yeah. So I took a hit and stayed in the control room, which was fun, but. Um, they had tunes, so we'd run tunes. We'd look at a chart. There was one tune that we improvised completely with nothing but David singing the melody once. And the best version of it is not on the record. The best version of it was so hot. And, you know, we all played some wrong notes. Everything was fixable. But the energy of David just singing and playing piano, and we don't know when he's going to change chords when 
there was no indicator for, for it, it was so perfect it was so happening i was so upset when everybody wanted to do a second take and get their parts right i was like yeah. no 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 yeah. no way yeah. what's wrong with you guys that was so beautiful and yeah. and then uh, tony took the second take and he worked it up into more like a pop tune and i felt like it really lost its edge you know <laughs> um, that was that was my favorite that part with that and uh and and playing david um david and i would play like play each other uh different music that neither of us had heard before a lot when we were hanging out just hanging out so i got to play him um alvino ray do you remember alvino vernon the steel sure. player who mm -hmm. invented the um the vocoder and and uh, Why? Oh, back in the days oh yeah sure of course of course right so he had that talking steel guitar playing those really complex yeah, right he was like he used to he used to be he was like on the king family show or something like that yeah he yeah he and he did uh he oh his, yeah, yeah what, what his i i forget if it, i thought that his wife his wife was in the quartet that sang the vocals so i played him that and he played me this he played me this uh this male vocal quartet from um, from Berlin that Hitler kept in in Berlin, even though they were Jews, he kept them in Berlin because they were so good. He loved them so much, and eventually they escaped. But he played me some old material of theirs that was just absolutely stunning, unbelievable shit. And then we got into. Uh, uh um uh, uh, uh really it was really you're fun saying, saying and, that, then we were, wait just just to pause you're saying that hitler had his own private jewish vocal quartet he you had a, he had a, he had a little court quintet of jews that he kept in the country for his a quintet of, 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 <laughs> yeah, of yeah. that's a movie title wow that's <laughs> a quintet of, <laughs> right. wow it's uh um, who, who knew we would learn this tonight um uh, <laughs> no. not me Wow. Well, well, you know, obviously we got to come back and do this and kind of go through albums with you guys. But one thing I want to say um, for folks, um, we have a little time left, but make sure you follow these gentlemen on Instagram and on Twitter. They're both so active and creative. And um, I want to make sure we have the social links in there. Vert22 and, 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 and David M. Torn and then Torn David on on. Twitter, you can find those. But um, really interesting because both of you are, keep us in touch with what's happening right now, what your current projects are. Uh, David's always putting little clips up and, and little um, visits to his studio. So I, I wanted to make sure we got that in there. The Bowie thing, again, um, people that don't know those Bowie records, Heathen and, and The Next Day. Mm -hmm. and, and reality, reality, yeah. Incredible. And I wanted to say, um, there's a, sh there's a song, Vernon, uh, do you know this song? Uh, if you can see me, it's on the next day. That's like a Vernon Reed song. He ripped you off. Do you know that song? I, and, and that, I, I, actually, I think I have that record. I don't, I don't you know, know, there's some, there's some weird intervals in the chorus and stuff that doesn't sound like anything but a Vernon Reed tune on like mistaken identity or something. So oh, I don't know that. I'll yeah. check it out. People should check me on that, but that that's a very unique Bowie song. It's got these these things. Vernon, uh, you know, you said something really interesting on your on your Twitter the other day, and you said um, and it speaks right to what we're talking about tonight. Someone asked you about teaching and, and, and taking lessons. You said you said you know what? I'm more interested in coaching rather than teaching, and you mm -hmm. kind of expanded on that and, and expanded, which ties in again. You guys are on such wavelength. Ties in with what David said about this Hindustani music and this older thing of mentorship. Talk to us a little about that. And, and, and also, I wanted you to tie that in with what I think was a beautiful set of coaching, your Artificial Africa project. And, and so mm. talk a little bit of that. So, 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 so the reason I said coaching as opposed to teaching, it really comes down to you know, I'd done a couple of these masterclass things. I did one um, at Steve Vai had a music camp. And and I was really anxious about it because I was thinking, you know, like some of these kids are going to play, you know, some of these kids play rings around me, right? So what am I going to tell? You know, because that's the thing, because the teacher, see, the teacher's position is that the teacher is above the student and is 
and is, you know, I mean, is more experienced or otherwise, and is generally better than the student is. But I thought about it in terms of like coaching. I think about like someone like Customato, right? Like coaching Mike Tyson. Well, Customato can't, can't Customato is not boxing Mike Tyson, but he can look at Mike Tyson and say, you're pulling to the left, yeah. you're pulling to the right, or you, you should lift up your jab. In, in other words, having a perspective, like I could, I could offer something as a coach to, to, I could offer something to a, to, to a player that's technically better than I am, but I can give them a perspective. Like I can't necessarily, you know, that's the difference between being a coach and a teacher, right? Yeah. Like if, I, if I'm teaching, it's the, the presumption is like, you know, I'm going to show you some shit, you know, whatever. But in certain cases, that's not going to be the case. It's like, I should be taking a lesson from you. You know what I mean? If yeah. I want to, if I want to learn this particular arpeggio you're playing, I didn't sit down with you. You show me that shit, right? But coaching is a different, is a different perspective. Like it's like saying, like from having the perspective of what it means to be on the outside, to really be on the outside and have life and have events arrange themselves so that suddenly from being on stage at CBGB's, you know, I'm like, I'm in front of like, I'm, opening for the stones with living color, you know, like some, so, but, but also saying, you know what, I would have never got there if I hadn't taken left turns and, and done things that would, that would seem counterintuitive and everybody's on a journey. I can't guarantee, no one can guarantee that you're going to be a rock star. It's like, I, I'm not, no one can guarantee you're going to be one day you're going to be sitting with David Bowie and you know, no one's, you know, I can't guarantee, oh man, you're gonna you're gonna actually play, you're gonna actually have a moment where you're gonna be playing a blues with Keith Richards. Like that, that, you know, but it's about about committing yourself to a path and committing yourself to a journey and really taking on the nonlinear aspect of life. Like a lot of players are get messed up. A lot of cats get messed up right at the point, especially players that play well. And they play really well and they think that because they play well, that the universe owes them something. Mm. And the idea, because you're nice, you are owed some spot, some mythical spot in your head. That is not how it works, right? Like you gonna have to go on like jo like it, Jaco Pastorius went on a particular journey in his life that took him where where he went. Your journey's gonna be different than his. Your journey's gonna be different than David Torrance. Your journey's gonna be different than Vernon Reed's. Your journey's gonna be different than than whoever you want to name. It's going to have to be yours. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to include collaboration. You're not going to do it by yourself. It's, that's not going to happen. And you're going to have to deal with frustration, disappointment, you know what I mean, and all of those kind of things. Do you have the grit and the, the – you have the wherewithal when you get knocked down to pick yourself up off the mat. You've been kicked in your – you've been kicked in your teeth and you're – you know, are you going to, you know, because that's the thing. That's the, 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 the difference. A lot of times I feel, you know, people get knocked around and they're out. And, and what I think right now is that we have a situation where people get one disappointment and they're done. Yeah. And you deal with 18 disappointments. Can, can you deal with not getting a gig for two years? Because sometimes that could happen. It, it happened to me. I worked a day job and, and that's what I did because I couldn't find the work that was worth doing. And when I found something that was worth doing, I wasn't getting it. And, and, and it's true. I think, I think Vernon, the critical thing that I hear you saying, the critical oh. thing, my battery's going. The critical thing I hear you saying is what is important to me about masterclasses is 
is that you, you have the capability as an experienced musician who has been through it that, that can help all of those players like you, all of the younger players that I know that I have befriended or have befriended me and we've helped each other, all of them are better players than me. All of them, no question about it. And there, I, I'm, I know that there are a bunch of them probably on here now, and there's just no question about it, but I can still, and I think this is the thing about the masterclass thing and having all kinds of advice for serious players is that you can look at them and go, yeah, I've been through something not what you're doing, but something like that. And here's what happened with me. And then that's a huge lesson for how, you know, like how people always want to know, how do you hold on, right? How do you hold on? Well, you hold on and hopefully you have a teacher or a friend who's older than you who can guide you and say, you got to hold on. You know, eventually it'll end up being people like you, like I had Don and you had you had five or 10 or 15 other people, Shannon Jackson and, and you know, where people, Pharaoh said shit to me and, and uh, Don did and uh, things uh, that, that helped me think to myself, oh, I can do this. I can do this. Even, even your friends, right? Absolutely. I don't think, yo, people I don't in your think, life, yo, it's family, it's like, family, family and friends. You gotta you lean know, in. Those things, are so impactful. Like my cousin's grandma before she passed, I remember my family was really not thrilled with, with how serious, how serious I, was about, I was about music. And I ran, I was on Notion Avenue in Brooklyn and I I ran into my cousin's grandmother it was on Notion Avenue. It was just random. And she looked at me and she said, Vernon, you play music, right? I said, yes. And she said, and she looked at me and said, that's a good thing and walked away. And that, that was it. Yeah. And this is, and this, and these kind of things are pivotal, are pivotal things. A question that someone would ask you at a crucial time, an argument. I, I used to, I remember having a really bad argument with my, I, I actually was in an R&B situation for a time, right before I played with Shannon Jackson. I remember having an argument with my band leader and he was saying something, he was saying that, he was saying something that Jimi Hendrix was a white artist because he was popular with white people. And this really pissed me off. It really pissed me off. And But the thing about that argument was that it sharpened for me, it made me sharper about my, you know, you know, you know like my feeling about Black people and their connection to rock and roll music, it really focused me about my feelings about that. So even people come, it's not just people patting you on the head, it's also people coming at you. And, yeah. and, and it even, even, even those things that make you mad, they can be very instructive. So all of it is fuel and all of it matters. And the thing of, I think to hold on to, if you don't love music for real, you're just, you're not going to make it. If this, if this thing, if this sound, if these, if this thing isn't somewhere in the center of your life, I don't care how great you are doing this thing. If it's, if it's not that important to you, if it doesn't mean that much to you, you're done. Yeah. You know, it really boils down to, I think something right in there, which is love. It's about, love and it's about your love for music and sound and what happens to you when you begin to transform yourself and by the way other people through that love of music those things are that's really like seems so so essential and and uh it really it really makes a it it makes a cheap joke out of the question how, how can I make it? I don't know how you can make it, but I know you have to love it. And I, I don't know, I don't know. I had a dude after, after uh, I got that Grammy thing for with uh, doing that Jeff Beck tune, writing that Jeff Beck song. 
mixing it and stuff. I had somebody come to me and say, and I, I never thought of this, Vernon, in a million years, never would have thought about this. Somebody came to me to mix a record and I thought they wanted me to mix their record. And we had an amazing meeting, listened to the music. I loved the music. I thought, this is great. This is gonna be a great, I'm gonna mix this. It's gonna be fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, really looking into it. And at the end of the meeting, which was quite long and we had lunch and stuff and it was at my, my place. So we were chill. And, and the artist says to me, so here's the thing, David, what I want you to do is I want you to win me a Grammy. And I went, dude, <laughs> I can make a little weight. And, and, and he goes, no, I'm serious. And I said, I'm really sorry that you're serious. You can't be serious. I don't know shit about shit. I don't know anything. I don't, you, this was, this was an accident that happened for, in, in a million ways, it was an accident. And, and I don't know, I don't know what that means. That, that makes me feel like I'm under pressure to do something. I don't even know what it is. If, if, you, if it was a sexual threat, I would know what to do with it. <laughs> but this is like, dude, what is that? Yeah. Get me a Grammy, me? Dude, you know, <laughs> I, and, and I, I, think that, I think that those kinds of questions become kind of demean a, a relationship with music. It, it demeans it for me. It, it, it's not that I don't think you could want to have a Grammy. I don't, I don't see any reason why you shouldn't want that, but it's that, it's that inability to see reality as it is and deny the love that is necessary to stay in making music that, that, makes, that makes that shit just weak. And, and when, when you have a younger person say to you, what do I do? How do I make a living? And you make like, 10 suggestions. I don't know what you should do. I know this is what I did when I didn't have jobs. And, and then, then you hear the same question again, a week later said almost like a joke. It makes you feel like, dude, if you don't have the love, then, then, then don't continue, you know, just don't. Yeah, I mean, yeah. continue for yourself. Don't think about, don't think about doing it for your whole life. You have to find a way to just commit to it. Man, hanging around with, with Tim Byrne for these last like 15 years, as much as we've done, has been so instructive to me in this thing that we talk about a lot, which is will, how, you know, will and desire and love. It's so critical. And, and it's been, it's been a kind of a feature of our relationship in a way is that, and, and frankly, you know, I think it's that way with all of my friends, everybody that I'm friendly with, from you to Elliot, to Tim, to Dre, to everybody that I know, we know mm. what the commitment is. We, we know what it has to be. It's, 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 it's not sad and it's, and it's not a sad thing. It's a, it's a happy thing. It's just difficult. You know, yeah. It, yeah. Well, you know yeah, what I mean? The business has always been a, a crapshoot. The business has always been difficult. And we and we can be sentimental about 48th Street in the old days or whatever. But, you know, it's always been a sliver of us that even become a thing. And there are a lot of worthy people. There are a lot of great people that it, it is unfair. The way the thing you know, why is that tune popular and that tune not popular? Why is that person getting written about not that person? It is kind of what it is. And everybody, this whole thing about having love for it, you know, that's kind of like the baseline. Like you have to, you know, you have to be there. You know what I mean? Yeah, but, um, totally. It's, it, it's, it's weird. It's, it's weird. It's very weird now because, you know, the uh, right now the guardrails are all off and nobody knows what they're doing. You yeah. know what I mean? And everybody's trying to, you know, because we're inundated. Our minds are under assault in the sense that our attention span, right? Like to, to hear something and pursue it and dig it, that that requires a level of focus, you know, to say, to even want to find out what that is and, and respond to it. Because basically our attention, it's a battle, there's a battle for mental real estate, 
Back. That's what's happening with tech. That's really what's happening with with technology on a level. There's the part of that that's happening with social media. That's it's happening with the, with with being marketed to, mm-hmm. and and those of us that are making things, doing things, we also want a sliver of the potential audience's attention. The bandwidth. Yeah. 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 We only we got a few minutes left, guys. This is great. And first off, I want to say thank you so much for 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 doing this. And I want to extend that this has got to have a part two because you guys, this is a master class. Speaking about master, do this with Elliot. <laughs> well, yeah, we could do a guitar. Bleak I'm you in. Can... E sharp. You're in. I'm gonna okay. jump. I just want to give some respect to some of the people out here. So much love out there. Uh, people just just jumping in and and saying some great stuff. A great, um, a couple of things I want to say before we wrap up. Um, again, we've got um, an episode two weeks from now on the 29th, Friday the 29th, with Beth Fleenor, who's an incredible uh, oboist, woodwind player, vocalist, songwriter, composer, and Julie Slick, who a lot of you know from all kinds of things, but many years with Adrian Ballou on bass and many records and tours of her own. That's in two weeks. And then I we play, I play on one of her records. That's right. David's on one of her records. And yeah, uh, the second one, I think. That's right. And um, very soon after that, we're nailing it, the date down, but Henry Kaiser and Andy West are going to be coming up soon. Um, so please uh, don't forget to, to like and subscribe on, on Make Weird Music YouTube. Um, you know, this whole video is going to be available to rewatch, of course, after the stream. And, uh, and as Anthony kindly said at the beginning, you can find me. <laughs> socials yeah i'm on on all of it you know um twitter and and, and instagram we, we want to do this again and vernon i want to I invite you uh specifically to um to do the t- i'm put you on the spot right here to do the 25th anniversary of mistaken identity oh, i mean i'm sorry that can you believe that 25 I years i can't even begin to my mind is I know. I'm sorry, bro. But <laughs> 25 years. But you know, I, that record is still so fresh. And people who have not somehow you missed mistaken identity, check that shit out. It's still. I had it on yesterday, and it psh, it could have been came out last month. So we'll do that. And David, uh, 25 years, dude. Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah but, 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 and you know, I, and I think I think looking back is kind of corny. I'm not. I don't like that kind of stuff. But what's interesting about both of those records, Tripping Over God, and and mistaken i'm telling you you could play that blindfolder for people right now and they're gonna go what, what, is this last year is this is this you know and that and that's kind of one of the things so, so i want to invite you both back for that um we had a, a, a shout out here from a, a, and a great question that i want to touch base on to close with from steve lawson the great steve lawson is oh, checking right yeah. hey steve love his music love that guy uh, um and he was saying that He's really enjoying this chat and that it's leaning towards creative sustainability. And his question is, is, is a good one. How do you, and you're touching on it, I think, how do you keep making music? What do we need to absorb? What do we need to channel to be inspired by to keep on creating? If That's a big question, but if you can kind of give the audience a couple that things. Is a, that, is a tr- that is a trip because I, I, I tell you what, I'm going through a thing right now about writing. And in fact, I'm going to be doing some writing fairly soon with with Corey Glover some, doing some writing. And, and uh, part of the, of the challenge is being available to just whatever happens when I pick up the guitar, whatever, whatever the first thing happens, right? And not judging, but the availability yeah, because it's part of a thing like, you know, I need to focus. I want to write something about George Floyd, right? I don't want to, you know, like I want to write something about a subject, right? And and the challenge is, is letting go of what you think other people are saying about whatever it is and then getting to, well, what what did the, what did those eight minutes and 46 seconds mean? What did that, what did that mean? What did the eight minutes and 46 seconds mean? What did the hand in the pocket mean? What did, you know what I mean? And finding, and there's a small detail, right? There's a small detail that opens up whatever that is. 
It's not the big thing, right? It's like when I, I wrote the song Flying, the first line of the song, I jumped out of the window to get to the parking lot. And that very simple statement, the, ent the entire song unfolded from that. So there's something that's quotidian, right? Not grand, not blah, not, but something quotidian. It could, because in the small things, everything is there. Yeah. Good one. That's a great, yeah. Uh, 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 David, what, what uh, big oh, question. That was, yeah. that was a great ending. <laughs> <laughs> Don't start your mess, Torn. Don't no. start your mess. That was great. Seriously. But, yeah. I, I'm not really, I mean, that's a, the, the tough thing for people is what you discover when you, when you follow the love for, for music. These tough things are the things that you discover. I have all kinds of ways of challenging myself that mostly involve something very similar to what Vernon just described. I will set up a situation. I'll, I'll set up, I'll change. I'll just, I'll just plug a guitar in or I'll just pick up a resonator guitar at, or I'll play piano and I'll just say, I'm going to write something and I'm going to complete it. I'm just going to write it and complete it. And, and I think that the beginning of the process is the most important thing. When you make that first step, how in the moment with it are you? Are you, and, and Vernon referenced, what do other people think about it? Uh, and, and that's important to be able to walk around. And just in the same way, I think about this sometimes, for me, the creative moment in music is very similar to the creative moment in, in a variety of different kinds of meditation, in that you a lot of shit goes through your head and when you're meditating, lots of shit. It's just shit all the time. It'll just keep going forever. And what do you do to actually meditate? You stop paying attention to it and you fucking meditate. That's it. It's the it's it's dumb ass simple, but when you do that and you love music, you can enter into that state where you're in, you 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 don't have to judge the moment. You just be creative. You open that door by, by just allowing these clouds of thought to just go. Dude, it's a cloud. It, I, you know, I, I don't need to pee. I do not need a cigarette. I don't need a joint right now. You know what? Yeah, I had a fight with my kid and it's really bothering me. Okay, well, you're going to, it's your kid and you're going to fix that. You can put it to the side and concentrate on what you're doing because of the love of the music. And that for me always turns into something creative. I think, I think it's at the heart not only of good creativity that you can guide, but also it's it's the heart of improv. I mean, because especially if there's your improv and there's an audience and and they're expecting something and you know they're expecting something, but you have no idea what you're gonna do. So you gotta just, you gotta commit. It has to be committed. And I think that that's what gets the most creative moments. And and. I don't have that many, I don't think about lyrics that much anymore. I, 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 I don't, but it can be something like a, a, a phrase for me that would be a song, but I end up not writing it, right? <laughs> but a couple of something poetic that somebody said or something that I read or, or um, you know, poetry or something I read in a newspaper or whatever can trigger me. The other thing for me is sometimes Silence is a great silence and walking are, uh, or, or driving alone with no radio. All these things, mm -hmm. anything mm -hmm. used to be, used to be riding the subway would, would get me, I'd write like a dog right, riding in the subway. Mm -hmm. I probably wrote like 20 tunes. Same thing with the yeah. film music. I learned to stop working so hard in front of the computer and I'd walk down the Arroyo in Pasadena for two hours and until I had the main theme for a film and, and then go transcribe it and turn it into something. And, and I, I, think, I think there are a million ways we can find to commit, but there are 80 billion ways we can find to not commit. 
and 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 that's where the that's where the I think the the nub of of problems comes in. What do I not do? What what can I not do? You know, so I could be there. You know, that, I don't know. that is uh, so many great pull quotes here tonight, gentlemen, and and wow, we had we had the best some of the. Me and Vernon had some of the best talks on a on a a, a disjointed tour that have ever been had. <laughs> Pretty wild. <laughs> well, I I can say the same thing with you, Dre. That we really we just when we go, we just go right. Through planes, trains, and automobiles. <laughs> we call that what, tour. What What did Robert used to, Fripp used to say? Uh, oh, so we have we solved all the problems of the world yet? <laughs> <laughs> have we solved them? No, that that gentleman. This is, um, you know, um, thank you again. We're going to wrap here, and 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 a lot of apologies to people who didn't get their questions in. But you know what? Just letting these gentlemen, these old friends, these sonic architects, who who um, I want to personally thank also, because I mean, uh, and if I could just take sixty seconds, I walked into Irving Plaza in 1985 to see. Um, James Blood Elmer, and I looked in the paper, and some guy Vernon Reed Trio was opening, 1985, and, and Whoa. It, yeah, and it my man. life. And the next year or so, my bass player brought Cloud About Mercury to the, the rehearsal. So I mean, you know, um, it's no joke, and and I think I'm speaking for thousands of people listening, of all kinds of uh, creative people, not just guitarists. And we want to. I want to thank you for them. That that um, not only and again I, the past is whatever. The fact that you gentlemen have a trajectory here, where that kind of adventure spirit and that kind of breaking the rules the whole way, which is what make weird music is about. I want to thank you for everyone that you are still doing that, and you you expressed it tonight. So really, a lot of love. Oh, um, Absolutely. I miss look, you, David. Dude, it's, 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 well, it's, it's, you know, too long, bro. The, the next time I, 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 I either won't drink or somebody would should drink with me. <laughs> hey, you know, let's do it. We'll do the cocktail <laughs> version. We'll, we'll, this will happen again. Part two, we're going to, because I mean, wake weird music. We didn't, even, we, didn't even get, we, we didn't even talk about pedals. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> That's the thing. But, you know, there's a bunch of other interviews about that. But we're, 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 let's come back, and we're going to do one. Vernon, we had talked about doing one for this new project you're doing. Likewise, David, because th this is your home. Make Weird Music. Seriously, we invite you back anytime you want to talk about something new. And, um, you know, we'll do it again. Working on it right now, dude. All right. Yep. Man, this is great. Thank you so much, Andre. You're the best. For real. The best. Thank you. All right, man. See you, folks. Adios.